You know, I've been thinking lately. I've been thinking about the boarding house days. You know, Earl Nightingale, Tony Robbins, Dr. Joseph E. Murray, all of that stuff happened in the boarding house. And I started thinking about my first night in the boarding house. I want you to understand, I was working in a lab. I lived in the upper middle class, middle class neighborhood. And I was far removed from all the things that I knew. I was far removed from my original environment. And I was thrust into this chaos. I remember how I found it. Back then when people used to use newspapers, I was in the classified section and I found rooms for, you know, money per week. Because this room was 150 per week. So it was 600 bucks a month. All utilities included, you know, and, and it had up there like a living room, television, all this other stuff, right? So I go ahead and I meet the dude and his name's Anthony. We meet at the house, he shows me the room. And I, I didn't have a choice. I wasn't in a position to be picky. And since I was homeless, I didn't have a lot of time to go back and forth and wonder and, you know, comparison shop on boarding house. You know, that came a little later. Uh, I did move into another house that the same guy who owned the house in West, the West End, he owned in Decatur. And it was just, it was rough. I remember my first night there, I was sitting in my room and I just hear gunfire. Pop, 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 pop. Very close, like maybe one street over. And this goes on and then it's pop, 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 pop. Clearly there's a gunfight. And I'm sitting here like, what the? I remember I was sitting on the front stoop one day and this girl, who was a crackhead, was walking down the street holding a gun, firing it in the ground. She's just pop, pop. And I ain't say anything. I actually held my breath because I didn't want to startle her and she swing around and shoot at me. And she went around the corner like that. This neighborhood was beyond sketch. This neighborhood was where the dope boys, the dope, the prostitute, the pimps, I mean, it, this was the breeding ground for that type of activity. And I remember not too far away, there was a park that was super clean. And the, one of the guys, I forget his name, he actually got arrested for shooting a sheriff. He had negotiated with the drug dealers that they leave that area alone. And it was clean and kids could play. And, but... It was crazy. I almost, because I didn't cry, but I think I wanted to cry because it was so bad. I was in this little bitty room surrounded by all of these bad elements. I had fell. I didn't just fall a little bit. I had fell completely off the map. Uh, many of my friends or so-called friends would not deal with me. I had one friend who came and visit me. We're still friends to the day. And it, it, it's just a lesson in what happens when you don't prepare. One of the things that I, I want you guys to do is to prepare. And, you know, because the thing is, I worked three jobs. But the thing is, I didn't, I didn't save any money. If I had saved, you know, if I had these sensibilities that I have today, I never would have ended up homeless. I would have had a savings account, but all my money went toward the fam. And, you know, my ex-wife, she would just quit jobs. She, would, she was not a good partner in that regard. And I was unprepared. And while I was in that boarding house, I recognized that because, you know, you, you have people who go through all types of things and they don't end up homeless. I was just so unprepared financially and mentally because I thought, you know, you do a good job, you work. I was thinking that those checks would be there forever. You know, I show up on the job and it wasn't like that. It was a lesson in you got to think beyond your common level because, you know, I was just like a hardworking man. I was proud of my family. 
if I went to work with shoes in my holes in my shoes, then you know the fam looked good and I was proud of that. That was a limited mindset that set me up for massive failure. Uh, as a married man, I did not go out a lot. You know, I was either at work or I was at home. I thought those were my places to be. I didn't network. I didn't have situations set up. I remember while I was working in the North Side, and there was this girl, the story of Yvette. Yvette was a lovely piece of womanhood. I met her when I was in the military. She was in the reserves, built like a brick house. Yvette was working at North Side Hospital. She had just told me, you know, we could do whatever. If I wanted it, it was available. And I was like, I'm a married man. You can't talk to me. We're going to pretend this conversation never happened, blah, blah, blah. <sighs> Little did I know. Six months later, I'm calling LeVette. And she's like, well, you know, I, I'm seeing somebody now. and We live together. But, you know, maybe check out Bender, you know, a, a common a friend we had. And I actually moved in with him for a little while, but it was just too much and I had to move out. So this is how I ended up living in my car for a few weeks. And going back, looking back now, I can see all of the areas that I went wrong because I didn't have a social life. You know, I had a few friends. I was very strict about now, you know, it's like Mike Pence. I wouldn't allow myself to be in compromising positions with women. So I limited my networking and only hung out with people at work because we're at work, you know. Today, that would never happen to me again. I have a network. I have a savings account. I mean, I just went through a heart attack and a stroke. And other than being sick, that's the only regards that my life changed because I was prepared for the unexpected. And that's one of the lessons that I want to get to you guys, to be prepared for the unexpected. Because, you know, you guys who are dependent on your chick to pay half the bills, that's a dangerous position to be in. As a man, you need to be in a situation that you can handle on your own because you have no clue to when she may flake out or she may disappear. And one of the things that was firmly impressed upon me was the only person you can really count on yourself, you can count on, typically is yourself. You know, sometimes you'll have some amazing friends, but everyone doesn't have amazing friends and everyone doesn't have amazing family. And the big lesson here was to be overprepared for anything. You as a single man, you need to have a robust savings account. If you blowing all your money, if you like get paid on Friday and you broke on Sunday because you went to a strip club and you got to borrow 20 bucks from Ed, you need to stop living like that right now. I mean, as they like to say on these Internet streets, real talk. You need to go ahead and invest in yourself and invest in your skill sets. Because another thing that caught me flat footed was I was working in the lab and I got into an altercation and then I had, I would have got a bad reference. So it was very hard for me to get a job doing what I was doing. So that went away because I was so stressed out about the problems that was going on with my marriage. I was so stressed out about all of these situations that it was hard for me to focus. And I actually did something very stupid at work. And I could have went to jail. That's how stupid it was. So as a fully or, or, or self-actualized adult, you need to learn how to save some money. Because if I was saving money like I save money now, I never would have been homeless. I never would have went through all of those bad experiences. Because during this period, you know, because there was me living with people. And if your name ain't on the list, if your name ain't on the lease, your name ain't on the mortgage, you homeless. And I was told by Bender Blackwell that, you know, hey man, it was nice having you here, but you know, you wore your welcome out. Because I remember Chris was getting married and Nita, you know, protecting Chris's interest was like, when is he gonna be gone? 
you know. So I had to roll out and I fell into a situation because after Bender, after Chris, then I fell into this boarding house situation where I was staying in boarding houses for almost three years. And the thing is, while I was in this main boarding house, Anthony, because he had another property in Decatur, which was more expensive, and I moved out there for a while, and it was on the bus line, and I actually was able to bring my kids there. But I had to go back to the West End because I, didn't, I wasn't making enough money to stay in the Decatur house. So that was like, you know, you get a little taste of joy, then that gets sucked from you because of my circumstances. And also the West End house was set on the bus line, like uh, the 166, um, every 15 minutes. And when you are out here trying to work in Atlanta without a car, you gotta have a serious bus line situation because I could walk to the Marta station if I needed to be, if I needed. And if I missed the bus, because typically between like 6 and 8, 9.30, they were coming there 15 minutes. So I had to just get out there and get it. But, you know, your life is so different when you're in this situation. You find yourself not connecting with your friends because you don't really want to talk about your situation. You don't want to bring that up. It's like, hey, we went on vacation. What are you doing? Oh, I'm living in a boarding house with crackheads. Not exactly the conversation you want to have with Saditi folk, but there were many lessons that were learned in that house. And the, the biggest lesson that I can share with you is prepare yourself. Save money. Do not be one of these people who has to borrow money, has to go to the pawn shop, do payday loans. I'm telling you from experience, it's not how much you make, it's how you manage what you make. And that was a lesson that became impressed upon me once I got out of that situation because once I got to rent a crate, I had way more money. I mean, I was, you know, it was at a point because my income was so low that I could ball out and spend a whole check and still be cool. And, you know, and I was like, okay, you know, this is how we got in that situation because I, once I emerged to rent a crate and I started hanging around different people, listening to different conversations, I realized that I had a problem with money and I started to hold on to it. So that allowed me to escalate. And then I was able to get a car because I repaired my credit. Got me a nice, uh, I got a Nissan Maxima, which actually ended up getting wrecked. And this is what I was riding in for a minute until I bought that BMW because I did that big deal. I got that big cash check. And I started to learn about money and experience money because I was able to buy a car and pay cash. And next week, I still had a check, so I wasn't broke. This is why I always say manage the money you make very well. But the key is to make more money. To make more money. Because if I had these mindsets and mandates when I was in the uh, boarding house, there would have never been no boarding house. There would have been no crackhead stories. There would have been none of these, um, you know, in my room listening to people shoot at each other. There would have been none of that stuff. And living like that gives you a sense of post-traumatic stress disorder because you always on. You could never relax. You can't even relax in your house. I remember one day, me and uh, I believe Jafar was just in the living room. Boom, 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 boom. It was the police. They was looking for some escaped criminals. The cop put a gun to Jafar's head. I'm over here like this. Another cop comes up. Now they ain't them. No apology, nothing. And you're, you're so shell shocked that these things happen that we didn't even have a discussion. We went just back to watching television because it was such a norm. Dysfunction was a norm for that type of neighborhood. You know, I would be appalled if something like that happened today. It just doesn't happen where I reside. And this is one of the reasons that I will not live in the hood. You know, there's many people who want to romanticize the hood. You know, we're doing things, we got love in the hood. The hood 
can make you a statistic by just living there. You don't have to be participating in none of these unsafe reactions. You just have to live there and you can become a statistic. And this is from living in the hood, from struggling in the hood, from existing in the hood. This is why I have these mindsets. And you know, if you're a parent, you don't want your kids growing up in the hood. You're deciding that they're going to have a lower class of networks. They're going to have a lower class of friendships. You know, they're going to have these lifelong friendships with these hood people. That's not going to help them get to the next level. But, you know, I thought I would just discuss this because, you know, people want to hear about this and whatever else I can remember, I'll put it out. But that's it for now. Remember, manage your money very well. And I have a course linked below. Go ahead and grab that and make more money to prevent these bad things from darkening your doorstep.